Hello, and welcome to Africa, this enormous and astonishing continent. South Africa, to be more precise, just a short drive outside Johannesburg. And I'm here to talk to a remarkable man, Credo Mutwa. When I first came to South Africa about 18 months ago, within two or three days, I was introduced to Credo Mutwa. I'd never heard of him at the time, but from the moment I met him, I didn't stop listening and he didn't stop talking for at least five hours. And within the first few minutes, I realized I wasn't just in the presence here of a man of great knowledge, and he's certainly that. I was in the presence of a genius a unique human being. And Kreda Mutwa is without doubt the most incredible man it has been my honor to meet. Kreda is what some people around the world call a shaman and some deeply, deeply ignorant people call a witch doctor. And to give him his official title, he's a Sanusi in the Zulu nation. Uh, Sanusi is the carrier, the keeper of the ancient knowledge, the ancient knowledge of so much, including the ancient knowledge of history of Africa, where all this came from, where the people came from, what the truth of history is, instead of the uh, largely nonsensical version of history that we get through the universities and the schools from very, very well educated professors who know. There are only two Sanusis left in South Africa. Credo is one. And that's terrifying, because it means the true version of the history of this continent is dying. It's being lost to this official nonsense that we're told is history, but it's absolute garbage. History has been rewritten, and the people who can put that history together again are going out of this world as they age and are not replaced. So you're about to have, as I have, the enormous privilege of hearing this man talk and seeing his knowledge preserved for as long as the electronic medium exists. He is the official storyteller and keeper of the history, the knowledge of the Zulu people. But you know, knowledge is a very dangerous thing when you're trying to hold people down into a mind prison. You're trying to manipulate them. You're trying to control them. And so people like Credo Mutwa, who have the knowledge to rewrite history and therefore rewrite the present, they are very dangerous people to those that wish to control and suppress. This man has had endless threats to his life, endless attempts on his life, right up to the last few days. And he has upset the uh, hierarchy of his own people as much as he's upset those others in other cultures and other races that wish also to suppress the truth for reasons of preserving their own religious domination or keeping people in ignorance. And so I've come here to talk to Credo at length about many things. And this is a series of unique videos with a unique man. And what we're going to start out with is to concentrate on a bizarre story. <laughs> An off-the-wall story, you would think. But one which he is confirming at every turn from his own background, his own unique knowledge of this continent. Over the last few years, as I've been trying to uncover how the world's controlled by a few people, which it is, and who those people are, it has emerged from my research that, bizarre as it may seem, uh, a reptilian race from another world, interbred with humanity in the far ancient world, creating hybrid crossbreed bloodlines. You see references to these in the Old Testament and into endless of the ancient texts in the Old Testament. It talks about the sons of God, which in the original is sons of the gods, plural, interbreeding with the daughters of men to create the hybrid uh, race, the Nephilim. These gods were the literal gods of the ancient people. And they used to sacrifice people literally to the gods. 
And these crossbreed bloodlines, as ancient accounts tell around the world, were put into the positions of ruling royal power in the ancient world. And then, as is happening today, when you do the genealogy of the ruling families and the ruling uh, positions of power in the world, be they the 42 presidents of the United States of the Bill Clinton, be they the British royal family, be the uh, aristocracy of Europe, any of these key ruling elites, the top of the banking system, the top of the global business system, you hit the family lines which go back to these same ruling lines of the ancient world, royal lines, that the ancient accounts say were the crossbreeds between humanity and these reptilian gods. In other words, a reptilian extraterrestrial race has been controlling planet Earth for thousands of years to this day and putting its genetic compatible bloodlines into the positions of power as presidents, prime ministers, banking leaders, business leaders, etc. And this explains so many things where we get the divine right of kings from, the divine right to rule because of the bloodline, the genetics. Why these ruling families of the aristocracy and the royal families have always incessantly interbred with each other, just as the Eastern Establishment families of the United States do that produce so many presidents and banking leaders and administrators of government in the United States. And, astonishingly, as bizarre as I keep saying and seemingly ridiculous as this story may be from our conditioned perspective of life and reality. When I started talking to Credo Mutwa from his African experience and knowledge of the most staggering depths and variety, he tells exactly the same story that I have uncovered around the world exactly in great detail. And if Africa and the world is ever going to be free, and we are, then they have to listen to this man. And they have to listen now. I started out by talking to Credo about the origin of the knowledge that he is about to share with us for the first time in so many cases. Because this is the knowledge that only initiates normally get. But as Credo says, the world needs to know this. And so, this is a unique video. And this is a unique man. And like I say, I asked him first about the origin of the knowledge that he's about to pass on. When the white man started destroying our religion, when he started demonizing our gods, when he started ridiculing what we believed in and actually using educated Africans to destroy that ancient African religion. In many parts of Africa, say, our ancient religion went underground. And there were, call them secret societies, all over South Africa and Central Africa and East Africa and West Africa where this knowledge was was stored and kept by aging guardians many many of whom did not know that in other parts of the land there were other guardians who were doing exactly as they were doing now, when I first became a Sangom, I was already, say, a person of education. I had entered school as a child of 14 years, and when I became a Sangom, I was a youth of 16 years. And what, what my aunt and my, grandma, my grandfather, as well as my maternal grandmother, taught me, 
shook me to the core of my soul. I found that the mission schools had been teaching me lies about my people all along. Missionaries had told us as children that the only light came to Africa with white people, that before the white men came, we black people had no idea about God. We had no belief in a life after death. And that our people were just a race of savages who used to lie around in the sun, womanize, fight, and drink beer every day. I was suddenly awakened to the fact that Africans had in fact been far greater intellectually than the missionaries were, were willing to give them credit for. That like the white men, we had astrology, astronomy, we had surgery. In fact, I found that Zulu surgeons in the early years of the 19th century and the 18th century and even beyond could perform operations which white surgeons were not capable of operating. And the more I learned about my people, the more I wanted to learn. And when my, my initiation under my aunt Maina and my grandfather Zigo had ended, I wanted to know more and more and more. And sometimes I had to pay a ghastly price in order to, to, to gain this knowledge. In one place, here in the, in the northwestern Transvaal, my, my teachers found that I was really uncircumcised. And they told me bluntly that if I wanted to be a member of this secret society, I had to undergo circumcision. And I did, and it was screamingly painful, I assure you, because it was done with a clasp knife, which somebody must have blunted a little bit, just to make sure that I got the message. I had the same time, but I was, I was asleep at the time, so <laughs> we, have, we have that in common. And say, in some places in Southern Africa, if you wanted to learn the secrets of a certain secret society, you had to do dreadful things which I cannot repeat here. And at one time, in Barotseland, in the west of, of uh, 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 what is today Zambia, the, the, my, my teacher said, look, how far are you willing to go in order to become one of us? I said, I am willing to go anyway. He looked at me and he said, listen, educated man, we are tired of people like you. White men come amongst us to milk our minds and then to kill us. We want to be sure that we can trust you. And wait, sir. I said, great one, I am willing to do anything. He said, are you? I said, yes. And then, and then, they went into a graveyard, and from there they removed the hand of a corpse, dead two days, and they brought it, and they challenged me to cook it 
and eat it. I did so. And these were the people who first told me about a race of highly intelligent beings which they called the Chitauri, the Tokas, a race of creatures which look like reptiles, who have ruled the world for hundreds, if not thousands of, of years. Through this dreadful act, I was able to gain knowledge which was denied to even the highest Sangomas because they could not, they would not go through the ritual I went through. This okay. is how secret knowledge is protected in, in Africa. So, and at one time, let me tell you another thing. Again in Barotri land, on the border between Angola and, and, and North Rhodesia, as it was called, I was brought into a hut. And in the hut was a young woman. She was as black as ebony, and her hair was like a huge black cloud on her head. Her teeth had been sharpened in the Barozzi fashion until they looked like those of a reptile. And Mutwa was very puzzled. What's this lady doing here? This I'm supposed to spend several nights in this hut. So what is she? What is she doing here now? Credo Mutwa being a frightened Zulu, afraid of women but not afraid of wild animals, decided to sleep with his back to the wall, giving the lady a nice clean bed. And on the following day, Credo Mutwa was fined fifteen Credo Mutwa was fined fifteen pounds by the local chief because I had refused a sacred gift. <laughs> I had been supposed to do something very amazing to this lady to show that I was one of the people. My <laughs> That's not. But... <laughs> <laughs> Why, Credo, have you chosen to reveal this knowledge now um, to a much, much wider audience. Mr. David, please, Africa is dying. Africa say, is being murdered. And we are sitting like bloody fools. And we don't realize what's being done to our people. Say, I have proof that can stand in any true court of law, that the disease called the AIDS is a man-made disease. And this disease is going to kill three quarters of South Africa's black people within the next ten years. Say, so, there are wars in Africa which make no sense to me as a black man. Please, when people fight a war, Mr. David, why do they fight? People fight in order to get rid of something that is giving them pain. Whether that something is a tribal chief or a corrupt modern government. They want to fight to remove this burden or to be destroyed by it. That is the idea behind a rebellion. But... In Africa, we find wars where a group of rebels challenges a government and tries to fight against it. And then these wars 
and in the total destruction of the particular country where neither the rebels nor the government wins anymore. And why? Because you, you find this force of rebels facing the government and all of a sudden the rebel army splits into little factions which start fighting each other and not the real enemy. Where, and soon it becomes a situation where everybody is fighting everybody else and the whole thing is getting nowhere. Say, I say that these wars which are destroying Africa this way are orchestrated by forces from outside Africa. Our people say, need development. Our people need peace in Africa. We are basically a peaceful people. We are not warlike. Don't let historians tell you a lot of rubbish. Africa is not perceived by the people outside her as she really is. One, my people are Zulus as a tribe famous for warrior exploits for many, many years now. But wait, do you know, sir, that Zulu people actually hated war and didn't love it as historians would have you believe? We Zulu people call war EMP, I-M-P-I, and we call it evil EMP or Ubumbi. Now the word Imbi and the word Imbi come from exactly the same root which means that which is evil. We, we call copper Itusi which means the helper, the frightener away of evil spirits. But we call iron Imbi which means the evil metal, the metal of war. Now, when a Zulu went to battle, he spiritually prepared himself for fighting. But when he came back from battle, a Zulu would undergo a ceremony of purification, a very, very painful ritual which lasted for some seven days before he was even allowed to touch his wife. But wait for this. In England, we have got the lady, Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough, writing in her diary that her husband, Sir John Cheshire, the Duke of Marlborough, after the terrible battle of Blenheim, had made love to her three times while still wearing his top boots. Wait, sir. Listen to that. Here is a man coming into his tent or whatever it was, with his boots still stinking with the blood of horses and the blood of men, and probably with human flesh still attached to the, to, the, to the soles of those boots, here is this man making love to his wife. What kind of attitude is that? That a man would come smelling of death and destruction to desecrate his wife in three Torrid sessions. We never did that in Africa. We hated war. And furthermore, our people, the black people of Southern Africa, are accused of having been a male dominated society. Absolute bloody poppycocks. Zulus were a, a female-dominated society. And if you want proof of that, ask yourself 
who killed King Shaga, who planned Shaga's murder, two women, twins, Mama and Mkabai, Shaka's aunt, who was the greatest advisor of King Shark? His mother, Nandi, she used to plan every one of Shaka's military campaigns right down to the last detail. So, everywhere in South Africa, our word for great also means female, but that is something we shall discuss at another time. So, we are, Africa is being murdered in a race of people which once founded some of the world's greatest civilizations is being cruelly exterminated and our politicians appear to be hypnotized as like a little antelope hypnotized by a python. Don't our leaders know what is going on in us? I'm going to talk, sir. I'm going to talk and I'm going to reveal and damn the consequences. I am not a brave man, but it's high, it's high time somebody stood up and exposed the conspiracy around Africa and their people. So let's start looking then at the force that is the common theme through all this history to the present day that's been manipulating these highly malevolent, highly destructive situations. Um, my own research uh, around the world has certainly focused in on the fact that there is a force, not of this world, shall we say, that is the common theme. What is your experience and your knowledge of an extraterrestrial involvement in the history of Africa? One of the most secret stories that was revealed to me sir, is about these beings. This story was revealed to me first in Barot's event, then in the country today called Rwanda, once known as Rwanda Urundi. Then I learned about this story at that time on the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. This is the story, a story you find throughout Africa. There was once a time when the blue sky was invisible, when the whole world was covered with mist, when you could not see the sun as it is now, you only saw it as a, a, a splash of white light moving slowly across the sky. At that time, there was an eternal drizzle every day of the year. At that time, People could not see the stars. People only saw the trees growing, trees which were very, very big. There was no desert at that time, only jungle everywhere where you went. At that time, say, people were what we call in Zulu, Nugubili. A human being was both male and female in one body. And out of the sky, one day, came terrible objects. They were like gigantic bones made of huge, gleaming gold. They were shaped like bows without strings, and they were bigger than the biggest mountains. They came out of the sky bringing great noise, black smoke, and fire with them. And out of those huge objects, 
came them. At that time, sir, human beings could not speak. We had no gift of language at that time. And people had, however, great mental power. A man would go into the bush and using the power of his mind actually call out an animal which he wanted to hunt and kill for his children. And the animal would appear and kneel down before the man and the man would kill the animal and take it home. But when the Chittawuli arrived in Africa, they told our people that they were gods and that they were going to give us human beings great gifts on one condition. We had to worship them and accept them as our creators. Some told our people that they were our elder brothers and that this earth had produced them generations ago. And they said they had come back to the green womb of their mother and that they were going to make us into gods. What they did, they created a very strange pair of caves in the land. They dug two caves. In one cave was a green light, in another cave was a red light. And they drove human beings into these caves. And each human being had to choose which cave the human being wanted to go into. And those who went into the green cave came out as women. And those who went into the red cave came out as men. And then the talkers, the Chitauri, told our people that now they were perfect. But the moment the first men saw the first women, a terrible row erupted. The women hated the men because they looked between their legs and they saw what they thought were snakes dangling between the legs of the men. And the men hated the women because they looked on their chests and they saw these big things. What they were, they did not know. And then the Chitauri laughed. It was to them a very, very big joke. And then the Chitauri said, if you serve us, you wretched little human beings, we are going to make you into gods. And the human beings agreed to serve the Chitauri. And the Chitauri gave human beings a second gift, the gift of language. People started talking with their tongues where they had talked with their minds before. And there was a big rubbish starting again because this man did not know the language of that man. And when this man greeted that man, this man thought that he was being insulted and so a lot of murder and culpable homicide started taking place all over the world. When our people were given language, they found to their horror that they had lost much of their mental powers. They had paid a terrible price. But the Chitauri were now the masters of human beings. They made them, the, the human beings to go into holes in the ground and to mine metal, gold, copper, tin, all kinds of metal the Chitauri forced our people to mine. And the people were very unhappy because they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, 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 they couldn't cope 
with the new sexual differences which were there now between men and women. And then, from amongst the, 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 the Chitauri came a very good female Chitauri. Her name was Mai Nzarantwari Samahong. Mai Nzarantwari Samahong was the senior wife of the terrible chief of the Chitauri. Umbaba Gorontwari Samahong. She was sorry for human beings, this great reptile lady. She said to the poor people, Ow, you are unhappy. And the people said, Yes, great one. We go into the holes every day, we dig the stones and we bring it to the gods. But we are not happy. And my Zarantwari scratched her scaly chin and to think she was terribly ugly. Her eyes were awful like lights in the darkness. But she had mess in her heart and she taught the men and the women how to make love. And she said, look, we, we divided you into males and females. Now this action is going to bring you together. Ah, but it did not. Because anyone who receives the gift from the Ntwari, the children of the python, is always in trouble. What happened was that when one guy slept with his wife, he didn't find her much. So he went to steal another guy's wife and there was a brick, a big remorse, as we say in African, starting. So men started stealing each other's wives and each other's girlfriends, and women started stealing each other's husbands, and there was a big nonsense in the land. And King Umbaba, the terrible uh, lord of the Ntwari, the, the reptile people, said, Look what you done, you stupid old woman. Now these people, they are, they are making such a noise. Listen to all that screaming in the bush. They are busy making love there and our gold is not being dug. And you are responsible for this. And Zavantwari thought and thought and thought and thought. And then she got a plan. And she said, I will make them stop. When they make love to each other, the female is going to get pregnant. And when she is pregnant, the male is going to leave her alone. And that noise in the bush will not be so disturbing to you, my lord. And Umbaba said, you had better. There is no production yet. And so all the women in the world was pregnant. And Umbaba was furious with his wife. And so it went on and on until one day, Zavantwari, activated a black hero called Mweru. And Mweru challenged the great chief of the serpent people to a fight. And he cut off the royal pennies of the king of the snake people. And that caused a big war. Mweru ran away. But Umbaba, the terrible chief of the people, caught him and arrested him and brought him to his village. And there, the great chief Korontwari Umbaba said, Look, you cut off my thing, and I have replaced it with one made of gold, and I can't make love to my wife anymore. You think too much, you wretched little human being. Now, Umbaba had a terrible nail in one of his hands. A claw, and with this claw, he drove the claw into poor Mweru's nostril, making a terrible hole into his brain, and he started drinking Mweru's brain, and then he threw away the corpse. To this day, sir, we believe that the people, the Chitauri people, they eat human brains. 
And strangely enough, scientists have found skulls where the human brain has been removed and eaten by someone or something. Well, the, um, the hearing you speak here, and so many things uh, come to mind. First of all, you're saying that telepathy was the key form of communication yeah. before the Chilihu, the reptilians came. Yes, sir. And um, it, I guess it's like a muscle. When you use it, it gets more sensitive and more powerful. So the more you use your telepathy, the more powerful your mind got. And then when language came, it almost brought us into this three-dimensional world and disconnected us from that mind power that we yeah. have before. Yes, sir. And it's also interesting that the, the, the story that you talk about the language being given, and then the different languages being given. Of course, that turns up in the uh, uh, Old Testament, in the Bible, and it turns up in stories all over the world about the fact that we were divided by language so we couldn't communicate. And as someone who publishes books, I know today how difficult it is to communicate through books when you've got endless different languages. So yes. It's been a brilliant form of control for a long time. Yes, sir. Even, even now here in South Africa, today, sir, black people prefer to speak to each other in English if they belong to different tribes. And they have even, over the many decades, black youths have even created a lingua franca of their own, which we call Tsotsi, Tsotsi language, which is a mixture of African words and, and Afrikaans words. They do this in order to bridge the incredible language gap which exists between black people in South Africa. Let me show you the, an amusing thing, how different languages are. The, the language of the Khoza people of the Eastern Cape is very similar to Zulu, but certain important ways in the Zulu language good ways are viewed as obscenities by the Khoza people. For example, in the language of the Zulus, an ancestral spirit is called Ilos. But, if you use that word to a Khoza, he says you are using a dirty word because to them Ilos means sexual desire. And in the language of the Zulus, milimil, maize mil, is known as impu. But in the language of the Mapedis, maize mil is called bupi. And if a Zulu uses the word impu in front of a Mapedi woman, she feels that he has insulted her because in the Babeti language, Impupu means a woman's sexual organ. And in the language of the Mashonas, in the language of the Zulus, sorry, a mother is called Mama. If I say my mother, I say Mama Wami. But in the language of the Mashona, the people of Eastern Zimbabwe, the word mama means to sit down and have a crack. So, one day when I said to my Mashona host, the kumbule umama, which means, which in Zulu is, I remember my mother, I'm missing my mother, the Mashona gentleman immediately took me and directed me to his pit latrine at the back of his house. <laughs> because in the Mashona way, <laughs> mother is mine, not mine. So, you see this terrible difficulty, this subtle problem of language is, all, is a very big uh, 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 obstacle to communication in Africa. So, we designed languages. There is another language called Fanagalo, which is a lingua franca 
consisting of African words as well as nonsense words and, and Zulu words, which was used a lot in the mines in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. So, to bridge this great language gap, we have created langu artificial languages in Africa, and but today English is the preferred language of communication. Some say we should learn French, also another language of communication in Africa. Some of you know the problems of language uh, can be uh, funny, but um, it, it is the same situation, the divide and rule, that is actually in, in other expressions created this tremendous turmoil in Africa and other places in the world. And we're, we're looking from my research and staggeringly hearing uh, you talk, you're saying exactly the same as I've come across. It's an incredible confirmation that a reptilian race from another world has been behind the manipulation of humanity for a very, very long time. Now, what do these Chittahuli actually look like, the reptiles? I'm not a good artist. You're better than me, that's for sure. But, this is how we believe the Chittahuli look like. They were created in this... You, you see, sir, you white people, say that there are alien beings on this earth. No, you are wrong. The earth in which we live has produced 24 different races during its long existence. Please, this is how a Chitauli looks like. It stands about 11 feet high it is a very slender being which seems not to have a bone structure. Its, its fingers have no joints. They are more like, they are more as if the bones in here were flexible. It, uh, some of the Chitauri have got three claws with a thumb. Some have got six claws with a thumb. And some of the Chitauris have got horns on their heads. And what surprises me is this. Some film producers, like the producers whom who make the film Star Wars, mm -hmm. often show creatures in their films which actually exist, which even the most uneducated of Africans who knows this Chitauli can identify. For example, in the new Star Wars film, what is it called? Star Wars or something like that, there is a creature who amazes me called Darth Maul. Darth Maul is a red and black being with a ring of small horns right round his head. That is exactly what the Chitawuli look like. Some have got ordinary heads without any horns on their on their on their heads. These are the lesser chitaul. But the royal chitaul king Mubaba Samahongo, they have got very long horns which grow this way. Not that way like a bull, but this way, like certain antelopes. Now I wonder, I just wonder, where these film producers get their information from. And in, in one strange feeling, 
which my student told, called me to come and watch. There is a, the thing called Stargate 2. Mm-hmm. And in that feeling, there was a creature, a very slimy, cream-colored creature with heavy wrinkles on its face. It was a spitting likeness of Mubaba Samahongo, the terrible emperor of the Chitauri. Well, clearly there's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge um, of what's been going on and what is going on, which comes out symbolically through uh, films and areas of uh, communication like um, Hollywood. But the thing that I'm totally stunned the more I I talk to you about this is because I've been uh, all over the world having people give me descriptions of seeing um, uh, reptilian type figures, particularly people in positions of power in the world, changing into a reptilian figure and coming back again. And what they describe seeing is exactly what the knowledge of ancient Africa talks about seeing. We're talking about the same people there, which is an astonishing uh, confirmation. It, and the eyes is something that keeps coming up being described. Tell me about the eyes of the Chittahuli. Say, a warrior Chittahuli has got eyes like a snake. These eyes are yellowish with split pupils and they glow in darkness. So if a Chitauri, a warrior Chitauri, one of the lesser, lesser classes, is hiding in a cave, you can see its eyes burning. But a royal Chitauri has got three eyes. It's got the yellow eyes which glow in a strange almost ice-like way, like jewels, like certain types of yellow jewels. And then they have got an eye in the center of their forehead, an eye which doesn't close up down like a normal eye does, but which closes from side to side and which opens this way. Now this eye of the Chitang is the eye that kills because it can knock a man down just by the fire, the glare that comes out of it. Is this where the um, uh, constant recurring theme of the evil eye comes from? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In fact, Mubaba, the emperor of the, of the Chitauri, who is said to be still alive today, Mubaba has got a central eye. His other two eyes were stitched shut by a jealous wife. But his killing eye, the summer hongo, the terrible red eye, opens. He can even open it like this. Mr. David, I would like to share a little thing with you. It is this. The best way to protect an evil thing is to deny its existence. And if you talk about things such as the Chitaur, if you talk about things such as the Mandinda, there are many people who say to you, rubbish! This thing does not exist. Now, in this way, this great evil is protected by being denied. One day in my long travels through the world, I I was in New York in that place called Harlem, and I saw a graffito on a wall along a a passage and the graffito was there is no such a thing as the mafia and we will kill any asshole who says that there is. In this again and again in America 
people deny the existence of the mafia. And by denying it, actually protect it wittingly or unwittingly. There are those who deny that a national and international conspiracy exists. They deny it ferociously. But by denying it, they are actually assisting it and actually we must stop denying the existence of these things. We must stop saying that there are no Chitang, that there are no aliens, that there are no Illuminati. There are. I could tell you for hours, for example, do you know what we Zulu people call a person, a very, very clever person, a very very wise person, a person who has received light from God. We call him Umkaniselwa. In other words, the illuminated one. Kanisa means to, to, to light up something. And Umkaniselwa is somebody who has been lighted up by the God. So you say Illuminati, I say Umkhaniselo. It's the same thing. And my research uh, very clearly, um, and again, you're right, there's tremendous denial of this is the fact. Um, even among conspiracy researchers, there's tremendous denial that the Chittahuli, the reptilians, and the Illuminati are actually the same thing. Exactly the same. Because... Amongst my people, we say that when two Chitauri are challenging each other for power and they must fight a duel with their terrible eyes, they start glowing like fishes deep in the, in the sea. And the f- faster they glow, the angrier they, they, they are said to be. Now that is why there are certain parts of Africa where people are advised not to walk at night because that is where the Chitauri often fight. And one of these parts of Africa is a remarkable place called the Mountains of the Round Rocks, Matobo wrongly pronounced Matopo in, in Zimbabwe. These hills are really not remarkable in themselves. These hills are, are said to be the one place in Africa where the Chitauri have been seen. And these hills say, is where Cecil John Rhodes lies buried, but there is more. You must visit this place at one time. Amongst the rocks on the Matopo Mountains, you find a species of lizard which you don't find anywhere in Africa or the world. A species of lizard which responds to the call of a human being. When I first arrived in 1958 in the land called Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, I found an African there who was a tourist attraction. He was a game warden who made strange sounds calling out, and as he called out, These strange lizards, the only type of lizard anywhere on earth which responds to to the human voice, used to come out of cracks and out of holes in the ground and to gather around this African. And it was this African game warden who told me that the the sounds he is making are not just noise. They are the speech of the Chitauri 
Star Courts. Isn't it a staggering coincidence that Cecil Rhodes, one of the greatest Illuminati frontmen, uh, perhaps of, 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 certainly of modern times, who did so much to imprison Africa, should choose to be buried at the point where this is all going on? You see, sir, Cecil John Rhodes went his way into the hearts of Africans and in their despair, wise men of the Mashona people, wise men of Makebele people tried to make Cecil John Rhodes one of them. They told him about the secrets of the Matopo Mountains, that under the Matopo Mountains lies a city a city of great wisdom which is the home of the last survivors of the Chitauri god beings in that part of Africa and if you go to the Matopo mountains and you carry a four pound hammer and you strike certain parts of that landscape with that hammer it gives out a hollow sound which shows you that there are caverns deep underground there. There are two sets of mountains. There is the Matopo Mountains, and then to the east of Zimbabwe, there are the great mountains known as the Inyangan, the Weeping Moon Mountains. There, even now, People disappear without trace. Sometimes a person would disappear for several days and reappear a few days later, not knowing where he had been or where she had been. And white people have disappeared there. Black people in their thousands have disappeared there. It was there that I also went missing for four days in 1959, in one of the most traumatic experiences of man. What happened? Well, it's a long story, sir. My teacher, Elizabeth Moyo, had sent me to get a special a herb which grows only on the foothills of those mountains. It was just an ordinary day like any other, just a beautiful day like this one outside here. And I, I love the African wilderness. I'm at home in the bush, especially in the days when I was still in good health. I love the animals, I, still, I love the, their smell, and I love the smell of the vegetation. And I was looking for this herb when all of a sudden a, a bright blue mist fell all around me. It took me some time to react to the strange thing. It was a hot day and all of a sudden the temperature around me dropped. It was as if I was on the slope of a very cold mountain. But it was a warm day. And then the next moment I was in what appeared to be a metal-lined tunnel, a curving tunnel, and I was lying on what looked like a workbench, a very large uh, workbench of some kind. You know, a, a, an iron table which a, a, an engineer or somebody working with metal would use to, uh, for welding and cutting metal upon. But this workbench was very brightly polished. And there I was lying there with my trousers missing and only my khaki shirt when I saw again through what appeared to be like blue mist a number of moving objects which at first I thought were dolls. And these objects were moving towards me. I noticed to, with mild surprise uh, that they were very thin, short, human-like creatures with very, very large 
melon shaped heads. The creatures had no noses. They, like human, as human beings have, they had only small little holes on either side of where the nose would be. And their mouths were like knife cuts at the bottom of their faces. And these creatures were coming towards me. In color, they were gray like certain uh, types of fish. And they wore silvery gray garments which reached up to their necks and up to their wrists. I couldn't see whether they were wearing boots or not at that time. And while I was looking at these creatures, I suddenly was aware that something was above me, standing there, and I looked up straight into the face of one of them, a much taller one than the others. And this creature was wearing a garment, like a tight-fitting overall, without any buttons or anything, which reached up to its neck, but its wrists were bare. I noticed that the creature said, had very long fingers. Its fingers had extra, and each of its fingers had an extra joint, and it ended in a claw, a black claw like that of a, a chicken or a certain kind of bird, and that its thumb was not here, but here in the middle of the hand. And this thing was standing above my head and looking down at me, and I was looking at its eyes, which were very strange indeed. It was as if it was wearing plastic goggles over its eyes. I could see its eyes inside these tinted goggles, and it had holes on either side here, but it had no nose as I have. Its jaws were very small, and its mouth was a slit with tiny little scale-like things where its lips should be. And the creature carried a horrible smell on itself. I can't describe that smell. It was a metallic, chemical smell, like, which seemed to combine the smell you would smell when somebody is burning brass or copper, and a very ugly chemical smell, these two smells combined. And this creature was looking down at me. I was frightened, but I could not move. And the next thing I knew was a terrible pain on my left thigh. It was as if somebody had just stepped me right to the bone. I screamed and I tried to jump away, but my body was my body was inactive. I could not move. I was not tied to any chain. I was not chained to the top of this table. There was no belt tying me, but I could not move my body. And when I looked down at what was happening, I found that one of the shorter creatures had driven something very painful into my left thigh. And then, while I watched, horrified, the creature pulled out this thing, and I saw that it was like a pencil made of shining metal with what appeared to be a flexible uh, uh, cable at the back. And before I could do anything, sir, my head was seized by the creature above me. It caught me on either side of the head like, like this. And then a four, a second, third creature drove something into my 
right nostril, yes. It was as if I had been shocked. The pain was so terrible sir, that I screamed and screamed, blood filled my mouth, blood spattered out of the nostril, and the creature did not seem to care. I was, I was stupefied. The pain was so intense, so terrible. And then, quietly, brutally, the creature pulled out the thing that it had stepped in, in me in the nose with, and blood flowed into my mouth, into, 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 out of my nostril, and I was choking. And then the big creature coldly turned my head this way, so that blood came out of the mouth, and which gave me some kind of relief. And after what seemed like an eternity of pain, the, the creature brought something out of somewhere, which looked, it looked like a, an old-fashioned tea strainer in appearance. And it put this thing close to my nose. And then I seemed to drift away and the pain subsided. You know, sir, it was torture so intense that even now I can't describe it. And then something else happened. A fourth creature started rummaging between my legs and it pulled out my organ of manhood and stuck something into that. It was very strange. But I wasn't feeling any pain now. But I could feel the, the flexible cable moving inside me, right into my body. And then I can't describe it. It was as if my seed was being sucked out by this small, bright, flexible cable. And then the creature just pulled it out. I screamed and I cried and I screamed, but I could not move. And then something happened, which to this day still amazes me. After the creature had pulled out the flexible cable from my organ, the creature just stood there looking at my organ. And I was so terrified that I urinated and accidentally urinated against the chest of the creature. It jumped away as if I had shot it and it stumbled backwards it, but its face didn't show any expression. Its mouth didn't even open, but the way the creature reacted, trembling all over, it was as if I had really hit it, but it was wearing this kind of garment. And after that, sir, I was left alone, except for the big creature which stood one to my right side this time with his arms folded looking down at me and then while I was looking at this creature trying to appeal to it no pain anymore no pain please I was pleading pictures suddenly flooded my mind pictures of buildings sunk in a red in a red lake of of water, buildings rotting away, buildings that appeared as if they had been bombed, and cities sunk in terrible mud, trees sticking out like rotten ghosts, trees without leaves, without branches, sticking out of the mud as if they had been poisoned. I saw visions of this. And then, through an entrance which I had not seen before, 
came a strange and terrible being. It was exactly like this. It was tall, made entirely of metal, with burning eyes and a snout. It didn't do anything. It just moved and came to stand at my left side. It didn't touch me or anything like that. It just stood there, making a strange humming sound. Wow, 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 like that. And then, from behind this metal creature, there appeared another creature. It was so radically different from the great creatures in that it looked exactly like an earthly human being. It had a pink skin like that of a a, a white woman. It had golden hair and its ears were definitely pointed like those of an animal. Its eyes were slightly slanting. They were pale, pale blue and never once did they blink. It was like this, mute, and there was a tail-like appendage at its back, which was very visible as it walked away after it had done to me what it did. What this thing did, it climbed over me and made love to me. And I noticed that unlike normal women, its breasts were set too high in its chest and they were very very hard in appearance. And that here, the pubic hair as well as the hair in the armpits, was a fiery red, as if it had been dyed. And this thing didn't even blink. Its eyes were just like this, looking at you as if there were no, there was no liquid in the eyes. Just an unblinking, terrible stare. And it was a small creature about the size of a 16-year-old girl. But it was very, very heavy as it sat on top of me. And there was no emotion in that whole nonsense. There was no, you know, I never And then the creatures took me out of that room after the metal creature and this pink creature had gone. This creature took me out of that room assisted by another one. And they pushed me along a corridor which curved slowly in that direction, in, in the, towards my right. And there I was shown many things which even today I don't understand. I was shown little versions of this creature swimming in huge cylinders of what, made out of what looked like glass in a pink, pinkish liquid like ugly little tent little frogs inside the liquid. They looked like like aborted human fetuses. They were very, very terrible and disgusting. And then we came to another room and there I saw a number of people undergoing the same torture that I had undergone. One particular person whom I passed very close to was a white man definitely a European with a yellowish beard and moustache and long straggly blood blood crusted hair this man looked into my eyes and I looked into his eyes and we were so close we were as I went past him 
Then to cut a long story short, sir, I found myself in the bush again. But but I was wearing only my shirt. My boots were gone and so was my trousers. So I took off my shirt and wore it around my waist as a, a, a loin cloth. And I started traveling, not knowing really in which direction I was going. Then I came to a track and I walked along that and some time later I saw people coming towards me. It was a group of young men and young women, Mashona people, and they were going to a trading store I later learned. I asked them where Elizabeth Moyo's homestead was and they directed me to it, but they kept a safe distance away from me. And later I, w I learned why. I was carrying a horrible non-human smell upon me. When at long last I came to Mrs. Moyo's village, all the dogs in that place went hysterical. They came at me in a pack wanting to tear me to pieces. And only the villagers managed to save my life there. Mrs. Moyo asked me where I had been and I said I did not know. And then she said, I know you, have, you had been taken by the little ones. I said, yes. I cannot understand. She said, you must not try to understand. You were chosen by the gods as a living sacrifice. So don't even try to talk about this. But how could I not talk about it? I wanted to understand what had been done to me, by whom and why. Even now, sir, I still want to understand what it was all about. And many years later, I met a remarkable white woman, Elizabeth Clara, a famous South African woman who had worked for British intelligence during the war and who, we are told, had been impregnated by a being from the stars, Akko. I asked Elizabeth, what, what was the meaning of the strange thing which was done to me? Because since that time, I had come across many black people, well over 200, who had been through the same torture as I. I had come across many black as well as Cape colored women who had been mysteriously impregnated by the same creatures that I had gone through the hands of. And let me tell you one other interesting thing sir, before I forget. About a year after I had underwent this terrible experience, I was walking along Jeppe Street in Johannesburg delivering parcels when a white man shouted at me to stop. I stopped I thought he was a policeman wanting to arrest me for some reason. And when I tried to produce my identity document, the white man said, Listen, I don't want your nasty word, passbook, kefa. I said, Then, sir, what do you want, boss? He said, Listen, where did I see you? Where did I see you? I said, I don't know that. But I, he looked very familiar to me. And then he said, listen, don't bullshit me, man. Where did I see you? Where did you and I meet? Then I said to him, I saw you in Rhodesia. 
in a certain place. You were lying on a table. If I had hit that white man with a fist, he would not have reacted the way he did. He went pale, almost dirty gray in appearance. And he turned away with a terrible dirty word and he walked away. His eyes were filled not with anger, sir, but with pure naked terror. Astonishing story. Yes, sir. But there is more, sir. There is more because I still want to know what was done to me. Say, one day you and I must talk more in greater depth than now. I would like, I would like to tell you that since that time I have found that I know things that, that a man of my standard of education does shouldn't know. These hands, and those who know me can confirm it. These hands not only have made these sculptures using ancient African metal casting secrets. These hands, believe it or not, can make guns and working jet engines. And one day I wish you to come back to South Africa and I will show you one of these things. I know things which I shouldn't know and it started at that time. Now, you see, sir, I don't, I want to know what am I since that terrible time. My life as a man was really messed up. And one day I will... T- Let me tell you, sir. Since that time, I have become a very confused creature. It's a very... It's a very... It's embarrassing, really. But since that terrible day, I became bisexual, which to me as an African is very, very disgusting. Since that time, my mind is, doesn't seem to be my own. I think about things that A man like me shouldn't bother himself about. I worry about people. I, it's sickening. Sir. I have ruined my life because of worrying about people. I feel that I could. I want to shake ev- to take every human being on this earth by the shoulders, shake them roughly, and say, "Listen, Pastor, there is more to this earth than you think." Say, I have seen the chitang. I have smelt them. I have, I have had personal experience of these. And there are people who claim that these creatures are gods. There are people say, who claim that these creatures are experimenting on us. That is a lot of rubbish. These creatures are harvesting us. These creatures are not aliens, Mr. Ike. These creatures are sexually compatible with our women. And what does that tell you? It tells you that they came from here. 